Hey everyone, um, going to go through some a little bit of introduction so you know who we are and why we're there's three of us up here. Um, my name is Chris Barker. I am a uh, suggestions purveyor slash consultant slash now help people with um, products at a software company. Uh, bef for a long time, I've, I've been doing operations. Um, I kind of gave up on that four years ago to go work at a software company so I didn't have to fix anybody's mail server. But before that, I was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and patching anything so that I could go back to sleep. All right, and my name is Adrian Thibault. I started out in operations as well um, a while ago and then decided that uh, maybe I should be working on the tooling to make operations better, and so I uh, moved into software development, and now I have very strongly held opinions about TLS. He loves it. Uh, and I'm Bill Weiss. Uh, I have gone between uh, doing operations, waking up at three in the morning to page, or getting paged, in security for quite a while. I now manage people, uh, manage an operations team. So that's why I'm here. I'm wearing the security hat. That's the FF shirt. So we wanted to kind of talk about the state of the industry um, around things where uh, before the idea of DevOps, before you know, people were working on these agile processes and you know, this idea that people were probably developing stuff you know, in Waterfall, sometimes they test it. Once it got through testing, you might release it. At some point, maybe somebody from, from the security team would walk by and review your code. Um, six months later, you might get a list of all the problems you have to fix in it, and then that might get on your next Waterfall plan. And what this really ended up leading people to is the fact that you really just were working with one continuous tire fire all the time. Everything was burning, everything was terrible, everyone hated each other, and there wasn't really a lot of cooperation or communi communication or collaboration on this. Uh, so DevOps, hopefully you all know about it, or Agile, Agile's a thing, or just collaborating, working together means that we are the dev and ops team is working together. We develop, we test, we deploy. Maybe we have a continuous integration system, continuous delivery, but maybe not. Maybe we just work together and actually talk about what we're doing. Uh, we write software fast, which is great. Um, but, and the devs are on call in some places, so they actually get to fix the software when it's broken, or they know when it's broken. They know what development, what production looks like. Uh, maybe you're doing TDD, whatever. Everything's great. We're all happy, we're friends. All's great. Except, of course, security doesn't see this uh, because they're still, you know, living in a world where um, everything's being released. Now, instead of a release happening every six months, it's happening every five minutes. Uh, there's no way for them to keep up with all of the releases that are happening. And so while everyone else is having a good time, uh, the security folks end up seeing someone just going through, leaving a trail of fire with everything. You know, now they're launching stuff in AWS. There's a thing called security groups that they may or may not know how to use. Um, you know, they're they're using just AMIs or do or Docker containers that may have zero days in them. Nobody's really auditing any of this stuff because now all of these fast collaboration tools aren't really working with, you know, any sort of focus on like security. There's there's they're still kind of out of the loop. And so, you know, what's kind of the problem here that we talk about? And uh, there's the the way we think about it is there's kind of structural misalignment. Everybody in different teams have different priorities. Somebody who's in development, the thing that they have to do at the end of the day is different than the person in operations and the person in security. They just have different priorities. And that's going to influence how they see the world, how they interact, and how they look at uh, you know, just what part, how, does, how do they interact with each other as a result. Now, for developers, our job is to take product specifications and frequently caffeine and convert that into functional software. So my goal is to get some information, get a design, and start cranking that out functionality. And I'm trying to work efficiently. I want to ship code in a uh, timely manner. Um, I want to build new and interesting things, and I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I want to use off-the-shelf libraries where possible instead of having to implement some, new fun or some e uh, existing functionality over and over again. Um, but this focus on just getting things out the door um, and just getting things functional um, without taking consideration like security or threat modeling or the fact that maybe I shouldn't do um, raw um, interpolation of uh, information into uh, a SQL uh, queries. Um, this approach leads to a lot of fire. 
And as someone who's sitting here working on the operation side, I pretty much want things to really just stop being on fire. I mean, like I'm the reactive person. My job is usually I'm the responsible one for the thing running in production. Um, I end up getting the software at some um, odd time, and I'm not just dealing with my development team's code. I'm using some vendor's library. I also have to have some base, some um, tools locked into it, some other compliance or security requirements. Have, have been feeling kind of the force down on me, uh, and you know everything is kind of terrible anyway. So. You know, I'm probably running around patching some software when I can, and I have a backlog. Um, I really just want things to stop burning. I'm going to take stability over features, which means that all the new things that Adrian wants to ship, I'm going to say no, because that's just another new product. No, you can't use this database. MongoDB doesn't really seem like it's a great idea. Um, it's been proven. Um, <laughs> we still have some of their mugs in the office. They're the most stable thing we've had from them. Um, <laughs> They haven't sharded, sorry. <laughs> and uh, you know, I want to minimize unscheduled work because I already have a bunch of stuff I need to get done. And like having that interruption, getting paged, that's going to reset my day, so I can actually get my backlog done. So most of the time, though, it ends up I, I just have to do do my best to kind of curtail the fire. I end up kind of standing around and watching. Well, that's that's just. That, that's that way. I have a cron job. It's going to restart that server every two weeks because that's the best I can do right now. Um, no one's noticed. So. Uh, so security, what do I want? Um, I really want things to just not change because then I can actually figure them out, right? New features mean new attack surface. Um, people write new code and there's horrible libraries they use and they forget to update a thing. Stop that. <laughs> just just ship the software that we know is secure. And uh, great. Ever. Just, I'm good. Except, of course, new open SSL. Ship that right now. Patch, patch, patch. Change to change. Uh, please, please change that right now. But don't roll out any other features, please, because I know, I know you. <laughs> Catch me. So, the idea behind this is that actually trying to get ops dev and sec to actually do uh, what we call share the love, actually working together in some way. Uh, some of the ideas is you know doing things like uh, team rotations and ride-alongs, so that somebody who is from the security team, security team spends time with the development team to understand why their priorities are what they are. Um, to actually kind of build some empathy in there. Um, there may not even be you know put it, putting in uh, QA folks or you know all of this notion, but again, getting so people are starting to build some sympathy with each other. Uh, it is anybody who's working on the product, you also kind of go through the idea of getting security training and things like actually attending conferences like this, even though if you're an operations person or development or in security, just being able to actually understand the workflow. Uh, what we've seen from talking to people about this is the three of us up here talking about this from three different perspectives is really the first time anyone's actually gone out and tried to actually address the fact that having a developer, an operations, and a security person working collaborative, collaboratively uh, is new, and that probably, hopefully, we shouldn't have to be doing this talk in a year because um, people will be doing this, um, and some other components around this. Uh, I'm going to talk for a second about how, as a sysops person, how I can kind of handle this first. Uh, so emphasis is um, use config management tools. Uh, the idea of you know just for the fact that I can share out how my servers are configured to both my security users and to my developers means that there's actually transparency in how a system's set up. Uh, that allows them to actually see how the infrastructure is being built for them, how they can influence changes if they need to, uh, and kind of minimizes some of the blame game. I can actually say, look, this is how SQL is developed the release on your system, this is how the firewall is configured, this is how the system is going to be built for you. Uh, by doing that, that also allows me to shift to this kind of cattle model of how I'm managing my systems. If I can rapidly rebuild and redeploy any part of my infrastructure for a user, it means that when I do have to patch for OpenSSL, I can do that really quickly and then get that validated. It also means that I can get to the point where if we're in a security remediation area and a machine just isn't acting properly, we can feel pretty comfortable just taking it offline and knowing that we can get something else in its place really quickly. And part of this really allows us to then start from a sysops standpoint, bringing in developers and, developers and security people into the, 
into the team and into the circle so that we're, I'm talking about budget and planning and new infrastructure upgrades, the you know, devs aren't just surprised that you know, all of a sudden we have new hardware or new software that's available to them or not available to them because that didn't make the cut even though they were planning to use that for their tools. And for developers, um, the things that we write are where security starts. You, you cannot hide vulnerabilities behind or timing attacks behind a web application firewall, for instance. So security starts with you, and this means when you're working on a new application, doing threat modeling, understanding who your adversaries are, what you actually have to deal with, and getting security engaged early on. Um, one of our, uh, the other flamboyantly uh, haired person in the introductory picture for me, a uh, guy's name is Ben Hughes, and he told me how much he hates image magic, for instance, and told me about how I should be using graphics magic instead, because apparently one's really good at remote code executions, and the other one actually has security properties. So talking with security up front, saying, what are the best practices? What should I be looking for? Um, what is the state of the security world, and who sh what should I legitimately be worried about? Like, it is a 5, 10, 20 minute conversation that can head off tens, hundreds of vulnerabilities before, I mean, a uh, single line of code has even been um, laid down. And doing, and, and this level of uh, engagement is great, but if you do security or operations write alongs where you have developers actually seeing this is what it is like to stand up a server, this is what it's like to do security scans, um, getting people engaged in the daily uh, lives of uh, other teams, um, it gives you a better sense of empathy of this is what they're dealing with and also this is how I can avoid this entire class of issues before we even start. And of course, um, these are tiny, tiny little notes. And once again, I mean, if we're using configuration management tools, if I want to see how is this database configured or um, why did MongoDB suddenly go away again, I can look at the configuration management changes and say, hey, this is why my environment has changed and, and also say, I would like to use Postgres. And instead of throwing some requirements over the fence to operations or security, I can say, these are the changes I want uh, with this configuration management tool and it will have these impacts. And instead of um, trying to sneak things under the radar, it, it, we can talk about changes for infrastructure in terms of pull requests and code changes instead of, uh, yeah, I just deployed some more software and I hope you're cool with that. Yeah, no, I'm always okay with that. That's fine. Not okay with that. Um, so security, um, one of the things we can do to help these fine folks, people like them, uh, is we can start getting included in development early, as we said, we can start automating what we're doing. Um, we, the company we work for, uh, we had a bad day around SSL, we had a lot of bad days around SSL. Um, we helped build a tool that man in the middle is the software like part of the test suite, man in the middle of the software to see if it still connects, even if there's a bad CA in there. That helped them, right? Not only did we say, this is, this is a flaw, here's how we test for it. And getting that testing early and happening all the time means you don't have to go back and say, ah, oh, we did that again. Um, and it helps the developers understand what the problem actually is, which is great. Uh, and we have to get out of the like, blocker, I don't want to make any, I don't want to see any changes, like please do not roll out a new service. We have to get out of that mentality because the more you block people from doing their work, the more they try to work around you, right? You end up with, well, uh, you didn't want us to do this, so we used the company card on Amazon, and so now the company's just kind of running out there. Oh, you needed a firewall, you needed packet logs. Mm. You want to avoid that, right? And so if you can get early and instead of blocking people, get good at saying, okay, you want to do that. Either here's why I don't want you to do that, please here's how we can do something better, or just here's how we mitigate that risk, right? Because we're never going to be absolutely secure. We want mitigation, and we want to understand our risk. Um, talked to somebody at uh, GitHub a while ago. Who's supposed to say company names? I don't know. <laughs> um, and what they do is on every pull request, every time you make a change to the GitHub application, which they manage through GitHub, uh, there's a little robot that just runs some tests, security tests, and comments in there and says, hey, um, I'm a dumb piece of software, I don't know better, but that looks kind of scary to me. Would you find a friend and just double check that I'm wrong? Things like, I see raw SQL in your commit. There should never be raw SQL in your commit. You're writing a Rails app, like please stop that. 
Or maybe you should. Maybe you have a great reason and a friend looks and says, yeah, it's fine. Um, but again, instead of doing the after it's deployed or when it's being deployed, looking and going, ah, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. There's a SQL injection there. You just keep people from doing it. Or at least raise the bar there. Which is all we really want, right? Um, and remember that we all have different expertise. We all know different things. And so the devs don't always know about timing attacks. They don't always know how to do SSL right. I don't either, but like theoretically. Uh, <laughs> so you can help them learn. Here are things that you can do better. Here's why this is a concern, not just SQL injection is bad. Here's how to detect it. Maybe here's how to exploit it to see so you can learn how to do it. And it makes a huge difference. Uh, one of the ways that we've seen that also works with us and um, have been looking at implementing uh, where we are is the idea of um, building in part of this to kind of as a practice around this is doing things uh, such as uh, threat modeling exercises. Um, there's a book out there called Threat Modeling and it has the, evol the evolution of escalation of privilege card game where you literally get to go around and uh, play a card game with a whole team to then actually do the threat model against an application or a service or some one part of your component. That kind of shared uh, group activity between different people helps expose the things that Bill was talking about, about, uh, oh, well, you know, what happens if, you know, you have a SQL injection or a remote code execution vulnerability where, you know, this, um, certain strings are just going to be executed. Okay, well, let's go through all of the parts of a product where we process strings and where a user could then put that data into. And then you have really, at the end of this, you then realize, crap, we just made like 50 tickets, um, which is great because if we haven't shipped the software yet, then that means it's 50 tickets instead of 50 CVEs that we have to then do afterwards. Or, you know, worse, an actual active exploit as a result. So uh, some of the specifics that we'd kind of want to dive into a little bit is um, the coordinated planning is really big. Uh, where we are, one of the things we do when we start any new product is that we actually hold a mini convention inside our office uh, so that we literally have SMEs from around the company who, literally anyone who just has strong feelings about it. Um, you know, people who are very interested in this tool and everything from our services engineers who have to go out and deploy it for customers to our support staff, to our developers, to our own um, sysops teams participate in these. And they work with the product owners to actually get an understanding of uh, around this. And the idea behind this is that the product team can build a ton of content from these conversations and then start their sprints, start breaking all this stuff out into agile uh, workflows and then be able to ping people later on say, hey, so you, I remember that you were really, you had really strong feelings about how we handle strings. Uh, can you go take a look at this code? And it's not this random like person talking to you because you just spent three days hanging out with them, whiteboarding, working collaboratively, and kind of going through user stories. Um, the coordinated planning we've seen has worked really well. It also kind of helps, again, building that um, shared kind of activities with people that make it go stronger. And it's important to, uh, to consider uh, that building empathy between uh, different parts of the company, security, operations, development, support, um, this really matters, especially when things do go wrong. Because it's very easy for some faceless email to come in from security saying, you did this thing wrong, you should feel bad and ashamed, as opposed to knowing that um, Bill from security found this issue and he wants to help you work through it. And so in the former case, you can think, oh, great, security is writing me again. I am going to do the minimum it takes to get the issue solved so I can get back to my job. Or, hey, I can work with Bill and make both of our lives better. It is easy to get locked into that siloed mentality where it's adversarial. You're just trying to get your job done. Whereas you all work for the same company. And it, it's easy to lose sight of that. But if you are able to help you know, further the goals of security, this is a net win. This is worth your time. Maybe you should set aside um, a little bit of time working on some functionality you wanted just to further the entire uh, goals of the organization. Yeah, and one way to think of this too is, would you rather have um, not find out when somebody clicked an email or at least have 10% of the people say, hey, so I clicked this email thing and my computer's been acting strange? Um, or did you notice that when I tried to log into this website from my house that like this little red SSL error came up? Um, and being able to have that just area where they're not afraid to talk to you and give you that feedback, you know, that's, that's another way to just increase your ability for 
you know, just building a better experience for your end users if your own staff are comfortable having those conversations with you. Um, as a way to kind of build that empathy as well, there's a really awesome talk um, out there by uh, Alice Goldfuss uh, called Rockstars, Builders, and Janitors. It's online on YouTube if you Google that. Uh, and it's all about doing rotations. And it's about how do you get people to cycle through different teams and different departments and doing different functions, really, to understand um, how you can do that. And there's a lot of great data in there about how like, that, as, a, as part of a way to help burn down tech debt, and go through those backlogs um, actually helps just overall, you know, saving money, uh, which means that you can spend it on things that you would much rather be doing, like going to cool conferences and you know raises instead of just trying to pour water on a tire fire. And uh, I think it's important to say that when we're talking about that, you know, coordinated planning, right? You get together and talk about the product. You as a company need to be willing to actually do what you said you were going to do in that. I've been places where you have a big planning meeting and people can bring stuff up and then six months later it's like, hey, didn't we say we we're going to do this thing? Like, ah, yeah, meh, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, you burn a lot of confidence that way. You want to make sure that the planning is partially to get everybody's input, but also to get on the same page about what can we actually build? What can we do? And what are we going to do? Maybe to make our I'm trying to think of a not terrible example. Maybe to make our string parsing better, um, we're not going to build that one feature this time because we just have to build, we have to take care of a lot of tech debt and we did something kind of dumb over there. It's nobody's fault. <laughs> People wrote bad code, but like they didn't mean to. In that attitude of, again, coming back to the security not as a blocker, it's not about making people feel bad. It's not about coming and being like, you wrote bad code. Neither of you did, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, it's about saying, hey, like you didn't know this was a problem, let's fix it. Or you did know it was a problem, like why did we do that? What thing in our process meant you made that decision? I don't know. Um, and making sure they're all on the same page about that and can be honest about what's happening, this is part of the DevOps core philosophies, uh, is you need to not have blame. You need to be able to talk about what happened. Like he was saying about clicking email, you'd rather somebody comes and says, I did something that I probably shouldn't have. I responded to that email. I sent him my password. That probably wasn't you, was it? Okay, we can do something about it. Yeah, and uh, one thing also on there, um, and we, when we talk about um, like don't do flashy things first, um, a lot of people say, okay, well, what we're going to do is we'll do a bug bounty. We're going to go through and go through and do all these uh, tasks of, you know, we'll have the internet f help find our security flaws for us. Uh, and if you're at an organization yet where you don't even have a security team that's really started doing this stuff, you're going to end up uh, spending a lot of money on things that if you had actually took took the time to get your internal teams working in this collaborative um, fashion, you end up like eliminating a lot of the low hanging fruit. So that then you can get to the point of saying, "Hey, let's do a bug bounty. Let's go actually open these up, um, and then start doing these sorts of higher level um, kind of scans and." and pulling in the community for that. Because if you don't, um, two things are going to happen anyways. One, you're going to get hammered with a ton of new um, bugs that you're going to have to fix, and no one's going to be happy because the people that are going to have to coordinate on this stuff are going to have this massive influx of new work, but they still have the old model of working on them. So it's just going to be a terrible experience, really. Uh, versus, OK, well, we found out we've worked together as a team. We eliminated what we thought were 70 things that were problems, and then uh, which all would have been found by a bug bounty. Um, and so now we only have to deal with 15, but we got really good at fixing them because we had all this internal practice to then be able to find an exploit and run through the exercise to find a remediation for it. So every DevOps talk talks about de it's, DevOps is about culture and uh, practices and collaboration, and it's not about tools, uh, but now this is the part where we really sp spend a lot of time talking about tools. Because that's apparently what ha every DevOps slide has to have. Also, a DevOps slide has to have a cat photo. We'll get to that. So some of the tools that we're talking about. Um, Bill had already mentioned the uh, scans, uh, pull requests for bare SQL, um, really building security into your CI pipeline as part of how you want to uh, build things out. So that way, as your code is going through the process, you can just automatically scan it and make sure that you're not going to 
ship exploits or have any regressions in security. Uh, having things like automated testing to just validate every type of cipher that your application is going to use uh, for SSL just helps eliminate somebody just saying, hey, so you know, I decided to upgrade to this new library and I forgot to uh, you know, change the config file, so we're still allowing Poodle to happen. That's actually a really good point. Uh, so how many, of you, how many of you are dealing with software development, use SSL, do you really know if you've fixed Heartbleed or if you're vulnerable to Heartbleed? I mean, have you checked recently? Like, that's a real concern, and it's easy to regress. And with, once again, Heartbleed was a fairly small, silent vulnerability. So without checking, um, that could just regress at any point. So having this nonstop checking is very valuable. Yeah, and as we said, uh, there's also infrastructure as code changes. Um, one of the things that we've seen is being able to just rapidly test the changes to your infrastructure as well. So taking your infrastructure code and putting it into a CM tool. Uh, there's even um, tooling people have written out there where you can write spec tests against your config files. So you can say, okay, well, I realize that in the catalog that's going to be configuring the server, there's no firewall present. Um, so I'm not actually going to let you promote this um, code change that's going to like literally start building servers without firewalls on them. And um, <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, if you are, if you're in a position to do it, static code analysis can be amazing, right? There's tools for many languages that do it. If you're a rail, how many of you work on a Rails app? Okay. How many of you are running Breakman right now? Yeah. Okay. If any of you are not, please do it. Um, it's going to be bad the first time you run it. Honest talk. Uh, company I was with, uh, we had a pretty big Rails app. I had kind of a bad attitude about the security footprint of that software. Um, and one day, I had a bad day, and I was like, I'm going to run this thing and see if it finds any vulns in there. And Breakman kind of thinks for a minute, you know, I go get coffee, and I come back, and it has like 10,000 things. I'm like, well, okay, Breakman probably doesn't work. Right? Like, that can't be right. Uh, that, there's just no way. Like, our software's not that big. Jeez. Bad day. Uh, so I grab one of the devs. I say, would you, would you just look at the first, I don't know, five things out of this and tell me that it's wrong? He just was silent for a minute. He's like, uh, I have some things to go do now. Um, and it's easy to get discouraged by that, right? Because that number was like very big. And if it took him five minutes to fix one of those, 50,000 minutes of work plus testing. Um, but the good news is you build that into your CI system. You just want the number to go down, right? Down and to the right. Do we have fewer bugs this time than we did yesterday? Great. Are we fixing the big ones? Good. Um, and you will have that experience if you have existing software with any of that kind of suite. If you run uh, Veracode, for instance, right, on an existing C app, it's going to be like a really bad day. You're going to just find horrible things in code that you thought were was good. It's not good because code is terrible. All software is terrible. But it's okay. You will make it better. And just seeing that and all agreeing that you're going to make it better, huge win. Should I keep going? Uh, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, we were talking about testing SSL, right? You have a monitoring system, right? Those of you are running a SaaS, you probably have some kind of monitoring, sites up, sites down. Okay, great. Um, that same system could tell you if you support SSL v3 again, right? Probably want to page somebody. If, you're, if your software just sprouts some SSL2, nope, get up for that. That's a problem. Um, do that in test as well, so you don't get woken up just because you pushed a bad piece of software, but Maybe do that in Nagios or whatever you use. Hopefully something better. Um, you have, you have, um, you have new ports. You have a web, you have a web server, right? Your SaaS, you have a website. Um, how many of you would know, how long would it take you to know, uh, if that server started listening on other port? Like the internet can suddenly connect to port 445 on your server or MySQL or whatever. Um, that happens, right? People make mistakes with firewalls. You install software in the wrong place. Like, whatever. Uh, if you can't detect that, you're going to have a bad day. Right? You're going to... How many of you work on Mongo, by the way, before we keep ripping on it? Anybody? Sorry, let's talk afterward. Uh, <laughs> um, if your server all of a sudden is listening to the internet on Mongo, unauthenticated, like, you're going to have a very bad day. It's going to be terrible. And if you catch it and can fix it fast, maybe not, but if it's just a couple weeks and then somebody emails you and goes, 
Did, did you know that your customer data is like out there on Pastebin? Well, you're in trouble. Yeah, and um, lastly on this, the there's a DevOps survey. Um, so we, we do work for a company called Puppet, and uh, we do a DevOps survey. And uh, that actually has shown, one of the things that's come out of this is people adopting and building security checks and scans into their CI tools have 50% fewer uh, security events and are faster at remedi remediating them when that does happen. Uh, so this isn't just like, hey, this is a good idea, uh, but there's actually data that you can use here to actually back up justification of saying, we should do this to your management uh, because there's actually data among 5,000 people now uh, and businesses that have proven that if you're adopting these sorts of practices, you'll actually see benefits from it. It's not just an excuse to um, go to other conferences, uh, but you know, those are also good ideas to just go to conferences. Let's talk about it tomorrow. And he, he's talking about it tomorrow, so. I guess, um, so kind of wrapping this up, uh, going through what we've talked about is like getting the three kind of aspects of your business working together, the security team, the operations team, and the development team, and coordinate around this uh, is really kind of what we see as a, an essential aspect of getting this stuff done and finding ways to encourage those interaction points. So how can you have people just be more familiar so that their interactions with each other isn't just over tickets or over emails uh, or over budget meetings yelling over the fact that we need new firewalls and so no, you can't um, spend any more time on AWS uh, or whatever the, the practices are gonna be. Other stuff. Okay. Uh, so here's our cat photo. And uh, I guess we could have a few minutes, about five minutes for q and I I don't know, what, what's our, okay. 15, okay. Anybody have questions? Sorry, one way in the back. We'll repeat your question. So the question was for uh, people who are working with a geodiverse team where your primary form of interaction is through emails and tickets, how do we suggest kind of building uh, the sort of uh, communication and community around this? Um, well, uh, yeah. So I'm gonna let Adrian take, the, take this because he actually works with our engineers in Belfast, so. Yeah, so um, I think there's about, it's only like an eight hour time, di uh, or, uh, time distance from the west coast to Belfast. It does definitely mean some early mornings, um, but we do a lot of face-to-face -face collaboration. We, like, if we have something to discuss, you just get on a call. You make the FaceTime. You actually get to interact with coworkers, and the, the small interactions of being able to crack jokes and talk about people's lives, as well as talking about things that are actively going on, of, hey, I'm worried about this, or this just came to mind. Like the, the, it is, if you're working with a team that might be in India, that might be hard just because it is such a different time zone. But it is worthwhile to just try to, whenever you can, get on, get on a phone call or get on FaceTime or whatever you can, get the, that good person-to-person um, -person interaction. Um, or yeah, uh, you, we also, whenever possible, we try to fly people out to Belfast. And we have people working for Belf uh, in Belfast for a month, for six months. Um, so doing these rotations and bringing people from Belfast uh, to our office so that they can meet the team, they can be in the office, they can be part of things too. Um, we also have um, weekly meetings where we talk about the state of the company and things. And we do. We originally held it at, like Friday at 5 p.m. because that worked great when we were in Portland. Um, and we've moved that to uh, 9 a.m. to accommodate Belfast so that they don't have to stay up until like I don't know 2 a.m. So I'm, I think they appreciate having their their Friday nights. And the other aspect that we found worked with this really well is when we started implementing those mini conventions at the planning phase. And that's where everyone, sometimes this would start in Portland at like 5 a.m. so that we could have this overlap with them and we'd literally just have a workshop with a screen up with a video projector and a video conference happening with the team in Belfast. Uh, and sometimes, because it was usually like two or three days, we tried to align that with at least some of the team members coming to the Portland office so that we could actually, again, have this, like, at least, you know, this 
week of everyone working together and then going back to when it is going back to emails and tickets they're like oh well you know I know Ken like went out to here or I know Elise and you know we we know how this works we have to hang out we got to you know show them around Portland or got to go check out Belfast and so you have this um, community that you're working with um, and that connection is like those conferences we really only do once a year so some for sometimes teams only see each other in person once a year but that's enough to kind of keep the, that communication going for a while um, yeah um, and a thing I've seen work pretty well if you're in uh, so it's easier for us because those meetings those conventions are 20 or 30 people we can fly everybody somewhere for that uh, now if you had 20 offices and you have 50 people in each of them you're probably not gonna fly everybody somewhere once a year if you can do it great um, but if not just having a couple of people kind of make that trip periodically uh, gives you a little face time so that you know there's humans on the other side. It does lead to occasionally Adrian is the only person that team talks to because he's been there. But that's better than not. And you can probably, if, you ha if you're that big and you have that many people, you can probably afford to fly a couple of your devs from point A to point B periodically. Right. And then we had, I believe, a question over here. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, so I'm Chris Barker. I've been a, a sysops for a while, uh, for about eight years, and then kind of gave up on that, and then went over to, to working for Puppet on the software and kind of um, solutions engineering side. Uh, I'm Adrian Thibo. Uh, I started out in operations, moved into development, and now I specialize in SSL, X509, and all that fun stuff. Um, and I'm Bill Weiss. You're killing me. Uh, also of Puppet, uh, I started as a uh, systems programmer and then moved into operations uh, and then security and now management, uh, managing operations and security people. And, and uh, as a follow up, could you do a quick case study of how you, a big company might be able to uh, start this kind of collaboration that has all the problems that you Oh, so uh, saying like, could we, like, as in right now, do a case study, or just in in the future, just talk about it, or? Yeah, just an yeah um, I I would say the, and just push all the buttons on here, build slides. Everyone really just wants to go look at the cat photo, so. Uh, so really, what we've seen is. Uh, people adopting um, DevOps and DevOps tools is really the like the space to start with. I would I would say is look at um, the talks and the areas around how, how do you develop these agile collaboration, and you literally look at how can you just put security as part of that. Because right now a lot of those are like, well, DevOps is just for developers and operations, and really it's uh, a big chunk of that is like, well, you just need to you pull the security people into it. look at how much of that is. Um, those are the cultural changes. How do you um, minimize blame? How do you have stand-ups? How do you have these kind of uh, blameless conversations? Those sorts of uh, areas is really the, the starting point for all of this. Uh, once you get those conversations happening, you can then start referring to the other areas of it. There's practices. Um, this morning's keynote speaker uh, mentioned the term rugged DevOps as part of that. Uh, those are the other areas around like adding security as part of your DevOps practice. But really, it's kind of going into um, going, getting into the frame of uh, collaboration. The, there's a great book on this um, by Gene Kim, which is the Phoenix Project, which talks about the idea around that. Um, and then that's also based on you know, the goal, which is just you know, assembly factory line management philosophies as well, uh, which is going back to the idea of everyone everyone's job in the business is to make the business successful, uh, regardless of if you're the security person or you're the developer or you're the operations person or your manager, because at the end of the day, if the business isn't successful, no one has a job, um, unless your job is to just close the business. But um, And I think, I'll come back to you real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, I think at a micro level, so if you're in a big organization, you can't make sweeping change like that, the answer is go talk to those other teams. If you're a security person, Go to the developers who you're supporting and just say, hey, like, can I teach you about this thing we found? Or can I, uh, 
can we do a lunch and learn about running capture the flags or doing buffer overflows or whatever works. Uh, same for operations, right? Come and talk about like, here's what your production environment really looks like. All right, uh, one back there and then I'll, I'll come back to you. The question is, basically, if you're in a small enough environment that you're all one person. I mean, the good news is the collaboration is easy, right? You do all of it. Um, you do as much as you can, right? Uh, I think the answer there is you want to invest more heavily in automation to make your life not hard, right? If you, if you are a one-person operation and you are writing the software, deploying it, testing it, hopefully maybe securing it some days when they don't give you another thing to do, Automating some of that gives you some of that time back. And assuming that your management can see that and allows you that time to automate, it'll keep paying dividends every time. Uh, all right. How big is your team as a component of your development team? Question was, how big is our security team as a percentage of our development team? Uh, zero. We have no full-time security people right now. Um, we have people like Adrian who are like a developer of security things. That as a percentage is... Hmm? Yeah. Single digit percentage for sure. It's not huge. Um, and I think most operations aren't going to, right? You're not going to have as many security people as you have developers if you're a development shop. It'd be kind of weird. The thing that's worked for us, and I think this goes back to some uh, uh, earlier comments of what we've been building up is the internal, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear because uh, this is being recorded, but it is caring. It is um, being engaged and saying security matters. I mean, our customers, the, like the security of our customers, their data that matters, it's worthwhile, it's worth protecting. So yeah, if you need to take a week and go through and audit this code, do it, it's worth the time. Um, if you need to learn way too much about SSL, we will all benefit as a whole. So it has been about um, within the organization and working with other developers, kind of lateral movement of that caring. Um, so we do not have any security developers, but we are, def er, uh, are uh, full time. Um, we are hiring though. Um, so if you're if you're interested in working on this, we, we should talk. But um, it is about in, in, at the same time saying, "Hey, I noticed on this pull request there is this very very scary thing that you're doing. Um, maybe we should talk about how to prevent this, and maybe we should we um, we'll do our own lunch and learns or our own educational things." So. Um, even in an, or, an organization where you don't have a large set of uh, security-oriented developers, security matters. I mean, we're all here because we, we care. Um, and it is, where possible, help people understand um, that this is worthwhile, that it matters, that you shouldn't just be saying, oh, you know, we'll just take, have, like, cyber insurance take care of it. it is, it's worth caring and it's worth um, kind of conveying that to others. Yeah, and uh, this isn't also the whole like DevOpsy, like, well, this is a future where there's no there's no security person and there's no operations person and everybody is a developer who does all these hats. Um, as Adrian said, we are actually hiring for security people. We're growing to the size where having somebody who's kind of dedicated so they don't get pulled off to work on other things so that they can focus on it is something that we've seen as an area that we want to focus on. Um, but really, the the, the goal and the people we're kind of looking for in those areas are to be the educators to help educate developers and help educate SREs and ops and um, services engineers on those practices uh, and really kind of build in the, the culture of um, teaching and sharing these things. Um, and that's really the idea of like, you have some people who wear hats. We've The way that we've kind of aligned our engineering teams is that we have uh, primary focus on building features, but then there's kind of a secondary practice or maintainers guild where someone's like, well, I'm really interested in SQL, so while I'm working on uh, our web user interface part of our product as my daytime job, I'm also a member of the SQL users, the our, our, Postgres, our Postgres geeks like mailing list, and those people all just will work together. They'll coordinate, and you know that's where people who have questions about Postgres will go into, and that's how we kind of look at that is that people are um, drawn to certain areas of technology. Their focus on a day-to-day -day basis is building features that align with customer problems, but you know 
they're just the also the SQL nerd who, and that's what they're going to spend all their time on. And um, Adrian's the only SSL um, nerd, which is why his hair is that color. Um, he didn't bleach it; it just happened after he read the spec. Um, <laughs> Um, so you can come to my talk tomorrow about the DevOps survey. I think it's at 2.30. Um, if you, um, the DevOps survey is basically a yearly thing where we ask practitioners all across the industry, uh, what kind of things, do, what of these practices do you do? And how are your operations? How, long, how frequently do you have outages? How long do they last? Uh, that sort of thing. And we collect all of that. And there's a lot of really interesting data in it, actually. Uh, not to spoil the talk later, but there is a distinct grouping of companies that say they do like DevOpsy stuff and not, uh, which maps pretty well to companies that have faster mean time to recovery and fewer outages. Turns out if you're doing those things, you're probably running a better operation. And that's not you are running Puppet or Chef. It's not like you're running the DevOps tools. It's your developers and operations are getting along and you're talking about value. Uh, we had one back there first. Last, uh, last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Me? You're good. Uh, so let's go back to your role in thinking for the sake of one question. We are like the dev, we are the us, we are the CI. Right? And then we install a tool in two. Do we need to install a tool in CI? Is that the spec guy, the, right, the operation guy, or the dev guy? And then when that tool is implemented and it breaks or you need to work on it because it goes to application or it goes to pipeline, who's going to work on this? So it's maybe it's maybe like Okay, so the question, uh, tell me if I got this right, was basically if security wants some tool installed in the CI pipeline, like who among us in our three archetypes actually cares about installing it, running it, maintaining it? Um, the answer is somewhat it depends, right? Everybody, we have a strong belief, and you should, if you're doing CI, have a strong belief that it has to be green. If you're making code changes, they had better work, and the way you know they work is that they test well. Um, we have a group internally who basically just manages the CI system. They're the ones to do the carrot and feeding of Jen patching Jenkins three times a day. And uh, sorry, that was mean. Um, <laughs> uh, they patch Jenkins, they fix busted Jenkins machines, whatever, in a different organization that could be ops. Uh, your devs had better care about it, right? They have to buy in on if this tool is worth running, that means it needs to be green. If it's red, figure out why. Um, and your security people, certainly, if I'm, if I'm the one going, you will run Breakman and it will be green, I need to make sure it's not just wrong, right? And so if it goes red and you, as the dev, come and go, ah, like, I, I don't see it. I don't see what's wrong. I do need to have the time to go look and say, uh, well, like, I think this is the problem. Or eh, maybe the software's busted. It happens. And the vaguely snotty answer to that is, as well is if you're using uh, infrastructure as code, configuration management, you can say pull requests, accept it. So if someone wants you to run Breakman, cool, we'd love to see code that will install Breakman and configure it and things like this. I mean, you're, it is, you have the democratization of um, your infrastructure through infrastructure as a code. And we have uh, the moderator moving closer and closer. So yeah, it's. With configuration management, you can. You, um, um, if you want it, you can incorporate it. Dev, OpsSec, everyone has that ability to. Thank you. Um.